the main thing is just make sure that you are you know taking your time with it don't rush yourself make sure you understand the material and um, just follow along as I go through this lecture and this is what we would have done in class so with that being said uh, let's look at our learning objectives uh, again you want to jot these down make sure that you can answer them by the end of the lesson after we've gone over everything uh, if you need to pause the video to write these down real quick or uh, type these in to your document you can do that as well um, just hit pause on the video and um, when you get done then you can continue also there are a good many key vocabulary words um, I'm not going to ask you to define every single one of these words, but any of these that you think that you might be unfamiliar with, I would definitely recommend um, either underlining them, highlighting them as we go through the notes, or you can write them down on a separate sheet of paper and, and make sure that you understand them after the, after the notes are over with. But here are the key vocabulary, um, and again, any of these that you feel like you could be possibly unfamiliar with, then go ahead and write those down, pause the video for a few minutes, take a second to write these down, and you should be good to go. So, let's talk a little bit about what was going on before World War II begins. And some of this stuff is reviewed from the last lesson, so you may remember it, some of you may not. Um, but this is Germany on the eve of World War II, and of course Germany is going to play a major role in the beginning of World War II. So, of course, we know who the leader of Germany is. It is Adolf Hitler. He's a fascist dictator. Um, remember, fascism is extreme nationalism. Him and Mussolini are considered to be fascists. Uh, make sure that you understand that. Um, of course, Hitler is in charge of a political party known as the Nazi Party. Uh, they were in complete control of, of, of Germany by this time. They were in charge of German political and social life by this time. Remember that Mussolini and Hitler are going to become friends and they are going to sign an agreement um, which is called the Rome-Berlin Axis and they are going to be the beginning of what would be the Axis powers. Uh, eventually Japan would join in so in the Axis powers it's going to be Germany, Italy and Japan in the beginning. Germany has restored its economy and they have completed uh, economic recovery mainly due to Hitler rebuilding the military. Uh, Hitler begins to challenge the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, remember that uh, the Treaty of Versailles said that Adolf Hitler could not rearm, um, but Hitler goes ahead and he moves his army into the Rhineland, which we discussed in the last lesson. This was this goes directly against the Treaty of Versailles. And he's going to invest heavily into arms technology, which Treaty Versailles also said that he couldn't rebuild the German army. And so Hitler is going ahead and violating that by uh, rearming and rebuilding the German, German army. Um, by doing all of this, he's going to help put the nation back to work, and it's going to bring them out of this economic uh, depression or recession um, that um, Germany has been going through. Remember also that um, not only does Hitler go into the Rhineland, he annexes Austria in 1938. He said the Austrian people speak German, therefore they should be part of Germany. Of course, Hitler was Austrian. And in 1938, he annexes Austria. No force was used. Uh, there wasn't any resistance. Uh, the League of Nations did nothing um, since they actually, in a way, agreed with Hitler. But remember, the League of Nations is very weak. Remember, they were established after the Treaty of Versailles, and um, they really had no power uh, because they had no army. And, of course, the United States did not back uh, or did not join the League of Nations. Again, Hitler's going to make his desires known to acquire the Sudetenland. And when Hitler begins to threaten to take the Sudetenland, this is when some of the European countries are going to take action. Hitler would meet with the British, uh, the French, and the Italians at the Munich Conference. And at that conference, they would reach an agreement. This was uh, something we talked about in the last lesson, uh, where Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, is going to say that he has achieved peace in our time. 
he is going to agree to give the Sudeten land to Hitler as long as Hitler vows not to expand any further in Europe. Hitler also realizes that he has to make a friend with the Soviet Union. And the reason for that is because Hitler knows that Stalin and the Soviet Union are the only country that could probably stand up to him at this point. Therefore, he also knows, too, that he would like to take land in Poland, and he agrees to make a, uh, a pact with the Soviet Union. This is called the, non, uh, the Nazi Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, or the NSNAP. Um, Hitler has intentions of invading the Soviet Union. He would love to have uh, their natural resources. He would love to have the Russian people to use as a, as a forced labor force. And he would like to um, get that. But in order to get that, he knows that he needs to invade Poland first. Um, some of Poland was taken from Germany after World War I. Of course, Poland had warm water ports, which the German Navy would definitely need. And he knew that if he got parts of Poland, that he could use this as a staging ground for his invasion of Poland later on. So Hitler um, makes his intentions known to invade Poland to the Soviet Union. And he and Stalin would make this agreement saying that Stalin would get part of Poland and Germany would get part of Poland and Hitler would not invade Soviet territory. And of course, this is a lie, and this clears Hitler to invade Poland, uh, and it buys Stalin some more time to prepare for war, which would eventually come to the Soviet Union. So World War II would begin on September the 1st, 1939, with a new type of warfare used by the Germans known as Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg means lightning war and of course this is when you attack with airplanes first which was the german air force was called the luftwaffe you would also use tanks uh, the german tank divisions were called the panzer divisions usually these panzer divisions were made up of 300 tanks and then you would use ground troops and you would sort of do this uh, in in synchronization and um, eventually would overwhelm uh, the the uh, opposition. As soon as Hitler invades Poland, Britain and France would declare war on Germany for violating the appeasement agreement, the one that they had signed in Munich. Britain begins to mobilize for war and send troops to the European continent. Germany uh, begins to reorganize Poland and split Poland up with the Soviets. In return, uh, Germany began to set up martial law and they began the consolidation of the Jewish people uh, by forcing them to live in ghettos. Um, these were the most um, you know, undesirable places within some of the Polish cities, and then they would begin to take out Polish resistance. Now, after the invasion of Poland, things seemed to calm down. This period is often referred to as the Phony War, and this would go on from uh, really from... Uh, October or the end of September all the way into around April of 1940. Uh, this was a period where it seemed like that Germany was going to stop. And again, this lasted through the winter from 1939 to 1940. The British and the French were hoping that peace was still possible, but of course that's not going to happen. And, and on April the 9th, 1940, Hitler would ramp up the uh, invasions again when he invades Denmark and Norway. And May 10th, 1940, Hitler would take the Netherlands, Belgium, and eventually France. Again, you can see a picture of the German Luftwaffe here and, of course, the German tanks known as Panzer Divisions. So France, of course, was an ally of Great Britain. They had prepared a defense system known as the Maginot Line. This line was set up with nothing but trenches to stop a future German invasion. But the Maginot Line is not really going to be a match for uh, the German Blitzkrieg as they simply go around it. They're too fast. They're not going to get bogged down in the mud like they did in World War I. And, of course, once the Germans are in to France, 
eventually going to cut Paris, which is the capital of France, off from the Allies. The Allied army is going to be forced to retreat. During that period, the French are going to call for an armistice. Remember, an armistice means to stop fighting on June 22nd, 1940. And the Germans take over most of northern France and the Atlantic coast. In the meantime, the French government would retreat to southern France and create a government of their own known as the Vichy government, which is established in the southern portion of France. The British, who had been helping fight against the Germans in France, are forced to retreat to a place called Dunkirk, which is in Normandy. Uh, they were surrounded by the Germans and were almost captured, but luckily the British population uh, are going to send over all sorts of different types of vote, uh, boats to help evacuate the British Army, and they're going to save the British Army to fight another day and the British Army is going to escape, but if, if this doesn't happen, the British Army could have been done right there if they don't escape at Dunkirk. Here's a picture of Hitler in Paris. Of course, you see the Eiffel Tower. And of course, here's the map showing you the red area being the area that um, is controlled by Germany and the purple area where the Vichy government had set up shop. So after France is taken, there's really nobody else left but Britain to defend Europe against Hitler. This is what we call the Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain is mainly going to be a air attack against the British people. Uh, the people were disgusted with Neville Chamberlain's performance at the Munich Conference. And so in 1940, elections would emerge and in those elections, Winston Churchill would become the new Prime Minister of Britain. Churchill would immediately ask the United States for help. The United States is going to start um, sending supplies over, but the United States doesn't want to get involved. Remember, the United States is still practicing that policy of isolationism. They're trying to stay out of European uh, affairs, uh, just like they did before World War I. Roosevelt, who's the president at this time, does want involvement in the war. He does want to help Great Britain, but he knows that it's going to be hard to convince the people to become involved, especially when the United States is dealing with its own problems with the Great Depression. Roosevelt knew that a war would help end the Depression, uh, and, and it does, which we're going to talk about later. So he starts sending supplies to Britain and something known as the Lend-Lease Act, which you guys will get in U.S. history next year. Um, again, this is going to make the Germans very unhappy with the United States, and uh, they're not going to be um, <laughs> they're not going to be friends with the U.S. Definitely when they start helping out the British. Hitler originally has a plan to invade England. He thinks the only reason they are still in the war after Dunkirk is the hope that they can establish some sort of alliance with the Soviet Union, and Hitler's um, pretty correct. They're either hoping to get the Soviet Union or get the United States involved. In August of 1940, uh, the Luftwaffe begins bombing um, Britain. They look for British bases, harbors, communication centers, and factories. Churchill retaliates with an attack on Berlin um, just to show that he could hit Berlin. Hitler orders an all-out blitz on all British cities, particularly London and civilian targets. Most of these attacks by the German Luftwaffe in Britain would occur at night. And the Air Force of Britain, known as the Royal Air Force, would fight the Luftwaffe up in the skies and put up resistance. Hitler eventually, because of the success of the, Luf of the uh, Royal Air Force against the Luftwaffe, would eventually postpone his plans for invasion of Britain. Again, this is at Dunkirk where you see him getting in rowboats and everything, just trying to escape the German army. Uh, so it gives you an idea about how desperate things were at Dunkirk. These are some pictures from the Battle of Britain. You can see London there. Uh, you can see uh, the buildings that have been bombed. 
uh, people hidden subways. Uh, you can see the destruction that took place. Again, these are the people in the subways during the Battle of Britain. This is Queen Elizabeth. She served in World War II. She's still the queen now, even at this point, but she served as a nurse during World War II. So, Hitler has most of Europe in his grips, except for Britain. So he turns his attention to the Soviet Union. He had scheduled this attack for the spring of 1941. Hitler was hoping to take advantage of Stalin's trust at this point. He believed the Soviet army was not prepared and that they were unpatriotic and that they were poorly led. And he was right on one of those things, but the other ones you can see he wasn't. He postponed his evasion in the spring of 1941 because the Battle of Britain was taking longer than anticipated. Uh, Mussolini's failure to capture Greece and Yugoslavia forces Hitler to dispatch German forces to help out Mussolini at this point to the Balkans. And again, Hitler knew that he could not leave um, his flank exposed, which means that basically he, he didn't want to leave the bottom portion of Europe open to the Allies. So he wanted to make sure that those areas were under his grip so that the Allies couldn't come up from the South and eventually uh, attack him and form a two-front war. Germany decides that instead of spring of 1941, they would invade in June of 1941. And this is big because uh, just like with Napoleon, when we discussed Napoleon um, back during uh, the fall, I found out that Napoleon got involved into the Russian winter and the Germans are going to have the same thing happen to them because they waited instead of going in the spring and going in the summer, that's going to drag this out into the Russian winter. Germany had four objectives that they wanted to meet. They wanted to take the Ukraine, which was where a lot of food came from for the Soviet Union. It's considered the breadbasket of the USSR. A lot of wheat is grown there. Um, the Germans also wanted to take Leningrad, um, which is St. Petersburg, and they also wanted to take Stalingrad. All of these areas had industrialization centers. And Leningrad had a warm water port, which Hitler desperately wanted. They also wanted to take the Soviet capital, which was Moscow. And after four months of advances, the Soviet army stalls out the Germans and forces the Germans to ride out the winter uh, in the Soviet Union, which is going to be very, very key, and this is going to play a key, uh, crucial role in what's eventually going to happen. Now, we're going to turn away from Europe, and we're going to go to the Pacific. Um, the last time we talked about the Japanese, we talked about them taking Manchuria. Uh, we talked about how they were upset after World War I, how they felt like they had been uh, disrespected. We talked about how the United States had put an oil embargo on the Japanese. Um, of course, we mentioned all of these things. They attacked China. Uh, they go into Manchuria, Beijing, and Shanghai, and Hong Kong by 1941. In 1941 to 1942, almost all of Southeast Asia and Western Pacific were under Japanese occupation. They started referring to this as the New Asian Order. Uh, the Japanese were very brutal, they were not very tolerant of opposition, and they were very fascist-like, much like Hitler and Mussolini. They entered into an alliance, an Axis alliance with Germany and Italy, forming the Axis powers. And the United States sends an ultimatum to the Japanese to balk, back off or face economic sanctions. Um, of course, this is when they issued that oil embargo. Uh, preventing the sale of oil to the Japanese. The Japanese are going to react with an attack on the United States naval base at Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. The United States was now in World War II. So, the U.S., Great Britain, and the Soviet Union are going to form an alliance. They're going to meet for the first time at the Tehran Conference, which is actually in Iran. Uh, they're going to be known as the Big Three. 
Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Those are the big three. Make sure you know those. Um, their strategy, this is what their strategy is going to be. They wanted an unconditional surrender of the Axis powers, meaning Japan, Germany, and Italy, all three surrender. Stalin would keep Germany, the German army busy in Russia, which is going to give the United States and uh, Great Britain time to plan an eventual invasion into Europe, which would be D-Day. The British Army and the U.S. Army would focus on Africa and destroy all the German oil lines to keep Germany from getting uh, that vital resource of oil, which they needed to uh, have gasoline and things for their tanks and the weapons of war. The British Navy would blockade the North Sea and cut off the German supply lines in the North Atlantic. And the U.S. Navy would go to the Pacific to reduce the threat of Japan to the western U.S. coast. So those were their strategies heading into this war. And here's a picture. Uh, this is Stalin on the far left, Roosevelt in the middle, and of course Churchill on the right. These were the big three. Again, this sort of gives you an idea of where some of these battles were taking place. Um, and we're going to talk about some of them, especially the Battle of Bulge, D-Day, um, right here in Normandy in France, and then Battle of Bulge right here in Belgium. Uh, we're going to discuss those in just a few minutes, uh, but we're going to keep moving. So the Allies began their march to Europe really by starting in Africa. Uh, remember their main goal was to shut off those oil lines to the Germans. Um, the Allied forces were going to be led by uh, George Montgomery of Great Britain and George Patton of the United States. They're going to go to Spain first. Uh, immediately they're going to push to the east into um, parts of Algeria. The Germans were going to be led by um, the Desert Fox, is, is what they nicknamed him. Uh, his name was Reich Marshal Erwin Rommel. Um, he had pushed west from Egypt. And the major battle that's going to occur in North Africa is the Battle of El Amin. Uh, the Germans' advance was stopped there at El Amin, and that's going to be huge because from there on in, the Germans are going to start losing ground in Africa, and those oil lines are going to be shut off. So the Allies are going to turn the tide against the Germans. In November 1942, Germans and Italians surrendered in Libya and Egypt. So pretty much they've driven uh, the Germans and the Italians out of uh, North Africa. Now the Allies began to push into southern Europe via Italy, and they're going to move into Sicily and then on to uh, the peninsula of Italy. This is a picture of Erwin Rommel, and of course, like I said, he's often referred to as the Desert Fox because he fought in North Africa with tanks, in case you didn't know that. So... Back to the Soviet Union, remember the German army has bogged down in the Russian winter. And November the, uh, of 1942 to February of 1943, uh, the Battle of Stalingrad would take place. This is considered one of the costliest battles of the war. Three million Germans and Russian casualties would occur. So a lot of people are going to die. And eventually German, Germany is going to be forced to surrender. After this, uh, the Russians are going to be pushed back out of the USSR, and uh, this is going to launch the final phase of the Eastern Front as the Russians or the Soviets are going to drive the Germans all the way back to the German border. The Soviet Union begins to push into Europe from the east, and this is just showing you what Stalingrad looked like during uh, this battle, and you can see it's pretty, pretty bad. Okay, in the Pacific, we get a couple of battles going on. We get the Coral Sea. Um, this is a major battle because it shows that the U.S. can stand up to the Japanese. It also shows for the first time that um, the United States is going to be able to not only keep up with them, but they're also going to protect their main base, which is going to be Australia. If the Japanese were to capture or win at the Coral Sea, then that meant that the Japanese could have a clear path straight to Australia, 
and then the British and the Americans would be forced to fight there. But um, because of the casualties and things, uh, the loss of, of um, battleships and things during this battle, this is going to be, in a way, a roundabout victory for the U.S., even though the Japanese are going to claim victory. Again, the U.S. naval forces would stop the invasion of Australia at Coral Sea. The turning point in the Pacific is the Battle of Midway, which occurs on June 4th, 1942. The U.S. defeated uh, the Japanese Navy, uh, sinking most of their aircraft carriers during this battle, which the aircraft carriers were the main way that they were able to uh, start war and take over some of these islands and places in the Southeast Pacific. Without those aircraft carriers, uh, the Japanese are going to be at a disadvantage. They lack the resources and the materials to turn around quickly and rebuild other aircraft carriers. Many consider the Battle of Midway to be the revenge for Pearl Harbor and the turning point of the war in the Pacific. The leader of the Pacific forces, of uh, Allied forces, is Douglas MacArthur, which we saw in the video, if y'all remember. He is the U.S. commander in the Pacific. From there on in, the policy of island hopping is going to be used by the United States. They're going to go from island to island, driving the Japanese out and eventually pushing their way uh, to um, the main islands of Japan. Again, here's a picture of Douglas MacArthur. Uh, he was forced to retreat at the Philippines uh, when the Japanese invaded right after Pearl Harbor. And uh, eventually he comes back. And here he is going back to the Philippines, getting off the boat and, and marching on to the land at the Philippines. The Allies are going to take Rome and Italy switches sides shortly after that. And Mussolini uh, falls from power. Um, the Axis are defeated in Sicily in 1943. King Victor Emmanuel III has Mussolini arrested. Later on, Mussolini would be killed. Uh, the Allied forces fight for Italy from 1943 to 1944. Rome finally falls in 1944 after the Italians surrender. Again, this shows the Allied army going into Rome, and here's the famous Roman Colosseum. D-Day is the beginning of the end for the Germans. Uh, occurs June 6, 1944. It's so often referred to as its military code name was Operation Overlord. And this was the Allied invasion of the European continent. Uh, it starts at Normandy, France. Uh, the troops are going to storm the beaches. And they're going to destroy the German defenses. And shortly after D-Day in August of 1944, the Allies would march into Paris and they had the Germans on the run. Uh, the end of the war in Europe would occur after the Battle of the Bulge in 1944 to 1945. Um, this is a major battle because the Germans try to push through the Allied lines uh, to drive the Allies back into France and keep them from entering uh, into Germany. Um, the United States would, would push the Germans back, though, at the Battle of the Bulge led by George Patton. From there on in, bombardment of Berlin begins. Adolf Hitler would move to his underground bunker. In March of 1945, the Allies would cross uh, the Rhine River, which is not far from uh, the capital, Berlin. The Soviets would reclaim Ukraine and Poland and enter Berlin in April of 1945. The United States and Great Britain would enter a few days later. On April the 30th of 1945, Adolf Hitler would commit suicide. And the war comes to an end in Germany and uh, for the rest of the world, uh, as far as VE Day goes, which means victory over Europe, uh, means that the war and the fighting is over with in Europe on May 7, 1945. Even though the war had ended in Europe, there's still a war going on in the Pacific. Uh, one of the major battles is the Battle of Iwo Jima. A very bloody battle. It showed how... Um, showed how, how much the Japanese are willing to fight in order to save the Japanese islands. Uh, it also proved to us that we needed to put an end to this war as soon as possible and try not to sacrifice so many U.S. lives. 
Roosevelt would die during this period. Remember, Franklin Roosevelt is the president during this period. He dies in office in April of 1945. Uh, he is the only president to ever serve four terms as president. Uh, all other presidents have only served two. Harry S. Truman becomes the new president. He is presented with the idea that we have a new secret weapon, which is the atomic bomb. Harry S. Truman makes the decision to end the war by dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The two bombs were called Fat Man and Little Boy. That's where their nicknames. Um, the Japanese refused to surrender after Hiroshima, so therefore the United States drops another one on Nagasaki, roughly killing somewhere between 150 to 180,000 people just with those two bombs. Japan would shortly surrender after that. On August the 14th, 1945, this is often called VJ Day or Victory Over Japan Day. Uh, August 14th, 1945, World War II comes to an end. Again, this is the fam famous scene of the, of the U.S. Marines raising the flag on the top of Mount Suribachi, which is on the island of Iwo Jima. And then, of course, down here in the bottom is the atomic bomb being dropped on Hiroshima. Now, one thing that we haven't really discussed is what Hitler did to the Jews, and this is referred to as the Holocaust. Um, remember, we did discuss the Nuremberg Laws and how they had segregated the Jewish uh, Germans from the society before the war. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, the German officials would meet in 1942, coming up with their final solution, which was the complete and total extermination of the Jewish people. Uh, this happened at the 1C Conference in 1942. Eight million Jewish Europeans were murdered during this period, uh, either dying in concentration camps or uh, dying in death camps. After the war, um, there was a Jewish state that was created um, in the Middle East called Israel. Israel was created after World War II, and this was for these people that uh, suffered during World War II, and it was a place where they could go that would be considered to be their homeland and their own state. But the problem is that, that Israel was under the control of another group of people, which is going to lead to more problems, which we're going to be discussing later on as well. The cost of the war, 72 million people were killed. More than half are civilian 47 million civilians. Civilians mean people that aren't involved in the military. Uh, there were a lot of refugees after World War II. Refugees are people without homes. Um, some of these refugees were Jews, and eventually they went to the new state of Israel in the Middle East. And, of course, there was unprecedented damages to property and infrastructure. Um, most of the major cities in Europe were in ruins, and this is going to lead to economic problems after World War II. Um, most of the economies of these European countries were bankrupt. This is a picture of Normandy in France after the war. Uh, this is a picture of Poland uh, and Warsaw, which is their capital. You can see the devastation. It's a picture of Berlin after the war. You can see the devastation there by the constant bombing. This is in Germany. And this is a picture of London during the war, which you can see the devastation there as well. And this is Hiroshima after the atomic bomb. Notice how everything's been flattened, except for that one church, which if you were to go to um, Hiroshima today, you can actually visit that church. So the war's over with. A lot of the Nazi commanders and officials and scientists who were involved in that war or involved in the Holocaust were put on trial. They were put on trial in Germany at the city of Nuremberg. These trials are going to go on between 1945 and 1949. They were tried with war crimes, genocide. After that, the Geneva War Convention would uh, go into effect. And these were uh, these conventions uh, were agreements that were signed in response to the horrors of the Holocaust and the Nazi occupation. So the war, Geneva War Convention uh, mainly meet or met and signed these agreements because of what happened during World War II with the Holocaust. Again, this is a picture of the Nuremberg trials.
The global response to the war, the United States and the Soviet Union became the two major world powers and began to dominate world politics. They were often referred to after World War II as being the superpowers. Um, they also started a nuclear arms race against each other to see who could build the most atomic bombs, um, most nuclear bombs during this period. And this uh, arms race would continue into the 1980s. Colonial independence movements would escalate in um, parts, other parts of the world. Uh, after the war is over with, mainly in India, Africa, Southeast Asia, and a lot of the empires during that uh, imperialistic period or during the period of the age of, of, uh, of imperialism, a lot of those empires will begin to be broken up. The other thing that happened was the creation of the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations would serve as a peacekeeping force and try to head off conflicts um, before they erupted into major wars. The United Nations would also help in the creation of the Jewish state of Israel. These are just some graphs showing you the military casualties of World War I versus World War II. And you can see that World War II, definitely uh, a lot more people, over uh, 15 million people versus 8 million people during World War I. So you can see who lost the most, and of course the Soviet Union during the World War II uh, lost more than anybody at almost 50%, uh, whereas the United States only at 1.9 um, of those 15 million. So uh, Soviet Union really took a big hit. Anyway, that's going to do it for this lesson. I know this lesson is long. Um, you've got a lot of other things that you can work on with this. Please make sure that those things are completed. And uh, if you got any questions, please feel free to um, uh, email me, ask me online, whatever you need to do. Um, and um, I'll be glad to get back with you as soon as I can. Go back and refer back to your learning objective questions. Refer back to your key vocabulary words. Make sure you're familiar with all those things. And um, make sure you've answered those questions and you filled out everything on your note sheet. Okay, that's going to do it, and uh, I'll catch you guys on the next one.